Vyasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasahami So, welcome everybody. So hopefully that uh, guided meditation made sense to people. Um, really leaning into what can be conceived of as almost the two meta skills of Buddhist practice, these overarching skills, uh, those being knowing and letting go. So the right mindfulness, that second part of the meditation where we just opened up and just whatever arises, whatever is manifesting, whatever is coming up, existing, what is happening in our minds, we just watch and we know that. And it's good to be able to practice that skill and to know how to shift into that accepting way of, of being, whether it's in meditation, because sometimes you can't manipulate the mind past a certain point. Or actually, that's always true. You, there's always a point past which you can't manipulate the mind. So being able to shift into this accepting mode, just bare awareness, knowing mind as mind. So we can think of that as knowing, K-N-O-W-I-N-G. Whereas this aspect of right effort, specifically the first two types of right effort that we chanted of abandoning unwholesome states, abandoning, say the mind wanders off, we're meditating on the breath or an object, um, a mantra, and then we realize that we're thinking about what we're gonna do this afternoon or what we did this morning or what somebody said to me or what I'm gonna say to somebody or all the different ways that we spin off when we intend to do something else. Being able to say, oh, actually, no, I have an intention. I'm gonna come back to that. And that's another capacity of the mind to abandon, to stay with one object. And you can think of that as knowing, a N-O-I-N-G. So knowing with a K and knowing with an N. And different schools of Buddhism or different schools of meditation philosophy will lean heavily, some of them, into one or the other, saying that the whole of the path is one of just stopping evil, unwholesome states, as we chanted, uh, or on the opposite side of that, cultivating wholesome states. And you have other schools of Buddhism or Hindu thought, Advaita thought, which say, no, it's all about just knowing, K-N-O-W, just knowing. If you just know, then everything will abandon. All the unwholesome things will just leave of their own accord because everything's impermanent. But the Buddha says that there's a time for both and being able to realize what the time for each of those is and being able to do that, do that shift, have that metacognition of what's the right time for what. Um, manipulating, uh, it's not the best word, but uh, coaxing and forming and molding our existence and inclining our existence. This is a, a word which the Buddha used a lot. Um, the Sanskrit Pali root is ni or na. It's the same root for bowing, which means to to bow or to, to lean into. So there are all these verbs which the Buddha used of inclining the mind, leaning the mind, uh, directing the mind in a certain direction. So that's what we can do. But we can only direct so far. And then, yeah, the mind will rebel if we try to push it too hard. The mind will just crack if you try to uh, press it past the point that it's able to be, to be molded. So, these are always good qualities to be keeping in mind, um, these meta skills of knowing and knowing. And I thought specifically to bring them up, they've been coming to mind for me because as Ajahn Nisibo mentioned last week, uh, last Sunday was the beginning of what can be, is sometimes called, I think even on the Buddhist Wikipedia page, it's called Buddhist Lent, L-E-N-T, so like the Catholic Lent, but it's called the Vasa, uh, which means the rains retreat. So it's a period of time which from the time of the Buddha till present day uh, in India and other places in Southeast Asia, it's the monsoon season, it's rainy, and it just makes sense that monks, the Buddha, 
prohibited monks and nuns from traveling during three months of the rainy seasons, which started last Sunday. So we can travel some, like Ajahn Nisimo and I are going on a camping trip on Monday, uh, but it's only three days. The Buddha said we couldn't uh, travel more than three, seven days uh, during this rains retreat. So it's a period of stability. This is a, a Catholic, a, a Catholic monastic virtue of stability. You just stay in one spot. And the Buddha didn't prescribe that all the time for monastics, but sometimes for these three months, we stay in one place and we cultivate uh, our practice more deeply and more intently. And traditionally, um, so we, Ajahn Nisibo and I, even though this is not the rainy season in Seattle, certainly not in California, uh, we still keep these three periods as a period of focused study and focused meditation. So we did that, we entered the rains, we have a formal ceremony that we do, and it's traditionally a time when people kind of up their game. You try to up-level your practice, specifically by maybe making some kind of determination, even some kind of vow or strong aspiration uh, for your practice. And that quality in Pali is known as aditana, aditana. Uh, it literally means ta, uh, t is the root, which means to stand. And adi is a, uh, it just amplifies that quality. So it's, a, it's really taking your stand. You're making a specific determination. I'm going to stand with whatever you aditan. So that's the, the verb in, in Thai. So people during these three months will say, for these three months, I'm going to meditate X hours per day. For these, so that can be for monks, for lay people, for these three months, there are some people who find benefit in uh, not lying down at night. It's a pretty extreme practice, um, and it's definitely not right, I think, for most people. Uh, we did it at Abayagiri, where I was ordained. We did it every single week uh, for like seven years I did it, and I think I never enjoyed it. I think <laughs> there, there was one time when I enjoyed it, because I was at a different monastery, and they did, it wasn't just like four hours of sitting before midnight and then another three or four hours after midnight. But we, it was like interspersed with almost like monastic games. Like we chanted something for an hour and then we you know, sat and then we talked and then whatever. But uh, yeah, so it's not for everybody, but for some people, yeah, experimenting with these different aspects of pra practice and habits, this is something which is important for, for all of us. Yeah, all of the spiritual life isn't just knowing with a K because there are aspects habits that we have, bad, which cause us to suffer, and there are habits which we have good, which when we do them, lead us to suffer less. So while I don't think habit is an exact translation of the Pali word kama or karma, which just means action in a Buddhist context, and uh, the Buddha says, what is karma? Karma is intention. Um, intention over time is habits. So our actions become our habits. Our karma becomes our habits. Habits are karma instantiated over time. So it's important to pay attention to habits. And there's a lot written in Western circles about habit formation, positive habit formation. But the Buddha was also talking about how to do these aditana 2,600 years ago. Um, so one really useful framework he talked about is four types of Aditana, which you can translate as strong determination or aspiration or even vows. Uh, four types of these vows or strong aspirations or four aspects of any aspiration. And those are wisdom or panya, sacha or truth, chaga, which is letting go, and upasama, which is peace. So wisdom truth, letting go, and peace. Wisdom, truth, letting go, and peace. And as a mnemonic, if you don't know that word yet, it's a good one, it's not Buddhist. Um, it's just a memory aid, so a good memory aid, which I've thought of for this, wisdom, truth, letting go, and peace, is wise troops ladle peas. Wise truths, troops, ladle peas, as in like, we can all think of ourselves as an army 
of the Dhamma, an army of light. And rather than just gobbling down all of our peas, we ladle them so we don't choke. Wise troops ladle peas. So that first quality is, is wisdom or panya. And this is really important. And I think most people here um, just probably were all old enough to see how inspiration and having high ideals, that's not enough. That's not enough just to have high ideals and to be inspired. You need to be wise about how you implement, uh, implement your inspiration and your ideals because there are so many ways it can go, they can go wrong if you just uh, don't bring discernment, knowing the situation. The Buddha in another place talks about six or seven different types of intelligence. There's knowing the Dhamma, there's knowing the benefit, what your aim is, there's knowing yourself, there's knowing what time, knowing what's timely, knowing um, what's the right measure, knowing the group you're in, knowing the time and place, basically all of these different aspects of temporal intelligence and interpersonal intelligence, and dhammic intelligence, but all of these are aspects of wisdom. And we bring that to our determinations. So if you're going to determine, and again, this works not just in Buddhist circles, you need to have wisdom with any kind of goal or vow that you're gonna set, whether that's for diet or for exercise or health. Um, these are all things, yeah, which are very good in Dhamma circles, but not at all uh, limited to that. But within these, say, Buddhist circles, different vows that you might wanna make, I would challenge everybody uh, is today, maybe even right now, consider for the rest of this talk and maybe even maybe even limit yourself, okay? So I'll be talking for another 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and just within this amount of time, see if you can come up with a determination, a vow, an aspiration, an aditana in these three realms, the realm of generosity. How can you be more generous, okay? The realm of morality or virtue or precepts. How can you be more integrated, bring more integrity to your life? Whether that's the five precepts, not killing, not stealing, not lying, not doing sexual misconduct, not taking intoxicants. That's the second realm of morality. And the third realm is meditation or bhavana, cultivation. How can you make wise, truthful, letting go, and peaceful determinations, aspirations to be more generous, to be more moral, and to meditate more, to bring more cultivation to your life? And that's the challenge. That's going to And specifically, uh, this is something which, yeah, you'll find in kind of modern um, yeah, advice about habit creation is SMART goals. This is another acronym, another mnemonic, SMART. So specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and timely. So come up with goals for your giving which are specific. Um, I'm going to, uh, every time I come to a gathering on Saturday, I'm going to bring one dish. I'm going to bring at least 20 calories worth of food to share with the community. And I invite you to bring more because that won't go very far. <laughs> That's just one, and you have to be creative. That's the, the great thing about aspirations, ins um, determinations. You have to bring your own creativity to it because only you, really only you know you in all of your conditions. Even in an arahant, a fully enlightened person, a Buddha might be able to know everything about you and your conditions, but even a fully enlightened person uh, otherwise, they don't know all your conditions. You have to make your own smart, specific determinations. So specific, measurable. How are you going to measure your generosity and your, uh, your precepts and your meditation? So one measurable goal, being wise about it, could be I'm, I'm going to meditate every day, keeping things realistic, uh, measurable, five minutes. I'm just going to meditate every day for five minutes in the morning. So specific, I'm gonna do that at right when I wake up. I'm just gonna sit right up and I'm gonna meditate for five minutes. So specific, measurable, it's actionable, it's something that you can do, it's not just uh, an idea that you're gonna have, it's realistic, 
So you're not going to say, if you haven't been meditating for uh, yeah, more than 15 minutes, it's not realistic to say, from now on, every day, I'm going to meditate for an hour every morning and every afternoon. I say that, but maybe it is realistic. I definitely know quite a few people who do a, a meditation course and then do start sitting religiously an hour a day in the mo- or hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. So it can happen. That could be realistic for you, but you have to judge for yourself. And timely. So both having a particular implementation intention, I'm going to do this at a specific time. Uh, for my precepts, say, if you want to up your five precept game, you say, Every morning at 6 o'clock, before I leave my room, I've got the five precepts printed up, and I've got it put on the wall before I go outside, and I'm going to recite that to myself every day before I leave my room. So that's actionable, it's specific, it's measured, you're just going to say those five things. You don't even have to do it in Pali, you can just do it in English, no pressure. Uh, And it's timely, it's at a specific time, and it only takes so much time. So these are smart goals. Just to share a personal story about a quite unsmart uh, goal that I personally had uh, was when I was not even a monk. I was just a white-robed postulant. And one of my teachers, Lumpur Liam, a monk who I believed was an arhat, someone who has basically finished the path in a Theravada conception, someone who I believe has no greed or anger. So this is somebody who I hold in very high esteem. And he was visiting a Baigiri at the time. And I, as a white-robed person, could drive the car. So I was driving him around, and I was having close interaction with him. And one morning, I got very inspired. And I had been thinking about it for a while. And I was thinking, sometimes if you visit monasteries or you've hung around these circles long enough, you'll learn that monks eat. We don't eat afternoon, but there are certain things that monks and nuns can eat afternoon, such as dark chocolate or even gummy bears. And as a young idealistic postulant, I thought, gummy bears, monks, nuns, come on, come on. You are just sugar bad, sugar no good. Yeah, you got, yeah, all this excusing yourself, you no way. I'm gonna do no sugar for one year. That was my heart and I'm like, that's so inspiring. I wasn't even Kobilo yet. I was Ian. I'm saying, Ian, that's so inspiring in my mind. And so I psyched myself up, and I saw Lumpur Liam. No one else was there. I didn't speak Thai at the time, but there was just one translator, and this is before everybody else was up. And I kind of kneeled and walked over to him on my knees, very, and again, I believe I have a lot of faith in this this monk. I still do. And I bowed to him, and I said, Lumpur Liam, from now on, for the next year, I will not eat any sugar. And then the monk translated it. And I think they both laughed and didn't say any. And there was no translation that kind of went back and forth in Thai for a bit. And then the translator said, are you sure you want to do that? And I said, yes. I said, yes, I do want to do that. And I thought I was so inspiring. I wish more people had been there to see me be this hero, this no sugar having hero. And then it was great. The first five days, I was like the best. I was the best. I wasn't even a monk yet, but I was the best monk. I was not eating any sugar. All these other monks are eating chocolate and gummy bears, and I'm there. Nothing. But day six, I failed. I went hard on the gummy bears. (laughs) And I lost it. And I actually, I think I I had to confess that I, to this monk who I believed, uh, yeah, and I still have a lot of faith in, I had to confess him. Lumpur, Ajahn, I, I failed. I did not make it a year. And, of course, he doesn't care. You know, he just <laughs> forgives me. I mean, he didn't expect me. He didn't ask me to do this. I'm taking it on myself. But that was not smart. It was specific. It was measurable. It was actionable. It was not realistic. It was not realistic. And, honestly, it kind of broke my capacity to make vows for a bit, for more than a year. Like, after that time, I just couldn't make a vow I would try to, and my heart just couldn't, couldn't do it. I, would, I couldn't even get my mind around saying that to make a vow. So I kind of worked myself up, an aspiration. Okay, so for the next 24 hours, I aspire to this thing that I want to do. I aspire to meditate 
for however long I wanted to meditate, to slowly working yourself up. And it's a muscle. It's what the Buddha called a parami, one of the perfections. It's a spiritual skill. It's a spiritual muscle that you can cultivate. And it's something which arhants have taken it to a certain level of perfection, and the Buddha has taken this quality of determination, vow-making, to an extreme, uh, to its fullest perfection. And we can do that. We can work our uh, aditana muscles just by making small, realistic, smart goals. So that's on the level of wisdom. So wise troops, what's troops? It's truthfulness. So we have to be truthful about the vows that we make. And this is where it can be helpful to have kalyana mitta, spiritual friendship. Kalyana means beautiful. Mitta is friendship. Um, so having spiritual friends, having beautiful friends, wonderful friends, who you can keep some accountability with, have a uh, accountability buddy. And so at, at monasteries, at, for monks and nuns, this is built into our existence. Every two weeks, we have a ceremony where we confess to another monk if we've broken any of our rules. And yeah, this can just be a ceremony, um, but it can also be something where we really bring some a level of accountability and truthfulness and honesty, integrity um, to our lives. If I've broken or s uh, kind of fudged on my precepts, I can tell a friend that. And you don't have to be a monk. In our Discord server, we've got a new Pasca group where I think m many people, if not most, if not all, of the people in this Upasaka group will meet up with another lay person, somebody else in the group. It might not even be someone you've met in person, but you say, oh, would you be interested in having an accountability buddy? And then you meet every two weeks and just talk about the goals that you've been trying to keep with us, the five precepts, not killing, not stealing, not lying, not doing sexual misconduct, not taking intoxicants, and then saying, actually, in the past week, um, I, did, I did lie. I did, there was some, someone asked me, uh, if I knew this particular person, they showed me a picture of them, and I didn't want to lie, but then they asked me again, do you know this person? And uh, feeling like they wanted me to know that person, I said, yes, I, I do know that person, and uh, fudging the truth, or however, whatever, that was a specific instance, but uh, whatever it is, any way that we fudge the truth, or whatever you're wanting to do, um, bringing some integrity, some truthfulness, and this is another muscle that you can, can, can cultivate and can exercise. So wisdom, and you've got truthfulness, and the next is letting go, this chaga. So in a Buddhist sense, the word chaga means the whole spectrum from just letting go, meaning generosity. It's a synonym for dana, for j giving up, just letting go of that thing you want to eat into your child's bowl if they ask for it, or the monk's bowl, or the nun's bowl, or your friend's bowl, or whatever it is, just giving up all the way to, it's a synonym for Nibbana, for the highest letting go, uh, the letting go of all greed, anger, and delusion. So that's Chaga, letting go, and we have to, we have to do that. Um, yeah. I'm just going to give you another mnemonic, because I love them. Um, so this is one which I learned from a very good book called Atomic Habits by James Clear, which I'll recommend to everybody. It was not paid. I'm not getting any kind of endorsement. We don't use money. But it's a great book. I've read it, listened to it um, multiple times. And one kind of insight that he has, the idea of Atomic Habits is to have a habit which is realistic and small. So um, atomic in that small um, circumscribed sense and yeah, letting go in a way which is uh, to induce this level of letting go, making habits which are O-A-E-S, O-A's. So obvious, attractive, easy, and satisfying. So it kind of sounds like always, O-A's. Obvious, attractive, easy, and satisfying. So on this level of right view where you're trying to cultivate wholesome mind states and, yeah, to cultivate wholesome mind states, wholesome habits, such as you're wanting to increase the amount. For these three months, you're wanting to tap into this 2,600 years of momentum. There have been monastics of 
every gender, lay people of every gender, making habits to increase the amount of ever meditation that they do every day. So for these three months, I'm going to increase this. And making that habit obvious, attractive, easy, and satisfying. So how do you make your inspiration to increase the amount of meditation that you do obvious? One thing you could do is move by a meditation mat, or if you, or I actually, minimalism is great. Uh, if you have a blanket, that can be a meditation uh, mat. This thing we're sitting on right now, it's a blanket. So having something that you sit on, whether it's a meditation mat that you've paid hundreds of dollars for, or a blanket that you've paid whatever for, folding it up, putting it someplace obvious in your house, in your room, it's the first thing you see for the last, basically most of my monastic life, in my room, the meditation mat is foregrounded. We have a principle, um, some of us, in the monastery, is when someone comes into your hut, into your room, they shouldn't be able to know where you sleep. So what does that mean? We, we sleep on the floor. Um, there's a rule about not using higher luxurious sleeping places. And so once we wake up, there's no bed, but we do have bedding. We might use like a, a thermo rest or just a big mat. Just hang it up, put it in the closet, and then nobody knows where you sleep. And there's a level of mystery and intrigue, and you can feel cool about yourself because you're doing like something that's unique. And um, so yeah, no one knows where you sleep, but foregrounding in the rooms that I've lived in and many other monastics live in, this meditation mat and the cushion are right in the middle of the room. So it's obvious. This is the center of my life. So obvious, attractive. How do you make the inspiration to increase your meditation uh, attractive. Um, you can have like a, a board with all sorts of inspiring things, you know, like a vision board next to the meditation mat. You could, um, yeah, be creative. Make it easy. Don't try to do too much. Just say two minutes. This two-minute rule, this is another thing in Atomic Habits. Just two minutes. Start off, if you don't have a meditation, practice, or even if you do, do you have one in the morning and the evening? If you don't in one of those, add just two minutes in one of those slots or midday. Okay, that's easy. Come on, two minutes. It's easy. Obvious, attractive, easy, and satisfying. Smile. At the end of your practice, smile, practice a little bit of loving kindness. It's satisfying. You're doing something that's good for yourself and good for the world, good for your family, good for your friends. It's satisfying to do that. So always obvious, attractive, easy, and satisfying. So that can bring a level of letting go. It makes letting go be easier. And then the level uh, we've got wise, troops, ladle, peas, and peas is peace. So just bringing this level of knowing. You have to be able to do this um, because we're not all G.I. Joe. We're not all Barbie all the time. Um, we are humans, we're all fallible, and we can only do what we can do, um, and it's good to push that. We don't, most of the time, we don't know how much we can do, so pushing these limits, but at some point, at the end of the day, at the, you know, you have to make peace with where you are, with where our conditions have brought us, um, so, yeah. Those four qualities, Hopefully everybody knows them. Maybe what's the first quality? You can all say it out loud. Yes, wise, troops, ladle, peas. Yes, wise, truth, letting go, peace. So bringing these aspects of determination and do it. And how did you do with your challenge? Have you found ways that you can bring more generosity and virtue and meditation to your life specifically? And so in the talk there, and would, would love to open things up to questions, and if anybody has come up with a, this is another way um, to bring some accountability. If you say what your aspiration is out loud, then everybody knows, and they might ask you about it next time you see them. So feel free. This can be a chance for you to say your goal, and then you'll be held to it by all of these nice people here. So in the talk.
We've got Miles, there's a mic runner, so if anybody has a question, uh, either here or in the Zoom room, you can raise your cartoon hand. Hi, this is Scott. Um, I have two questions. One is um, letting go. I didn't really understand exactly what you meant. The letting go of what? And then the second question I have is um, you talked about at the very end of the meditation was knowing the mind. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I'm, I'm confused about what that means exactly. Thank you. Yeah, the Letting go is crucial for any habit formation, whether that's positive habit formation or negative habit abandonment. Uh, if it's a positive habit, you're gonna have to give up, let go of whatever you're doing instead of spending the time and using the resources that you need to do that good habit. You're gonna have to give up that extra bit of YouTubing or give up that extra bit of uh, fill in the social media here or, and with a bad habit, it's more obvious what you're gonna have to give up is just giving up uh, the bad habit, giving up um, smoking, drinking, uh, whatever it is, it's hel like hurting your own health and uh, your relationships and your own relationship with your mind. And on that level of uh, mind knowing mind, um, I think for some people, there's an immediate understanding of what that means. And for some people, there's not. And uh, that's totally okay. And yeah, f one way to kind of tap into this mind-knowing mind is to just expand your uh, felt sense of awareness. So right now you can feel so you can feel your palm, you can feel your palm. If you bring your awareness to it, you can feel your feet, you can feel your knees, you can feel the top of your head, you can feel your shoulders, and you can feel the back of your head. And is there any porousness? Is there any kind of fuzziness around that? Can you actually feel where you stop and the world begins uh, from a first person perspective? And that can shift you into this awareness of space that from a first person felt Vedana um, perspective, yeah, my whole awareness of my body feels more spacious, and that can bring you into a more spacious sense of the mind. So I'm not just, the mind is not in the head, but the head is in the mind. The mind is not in the body, but the body is in the mind. So that, those two phrases in themselves can be a koan that might be able to bring you to that space um, that's being pointed to. I just think Ajahn Kovilo pointing to the um, aspect of mind knowing mind and uh, letting go is is helpful in terms of the skillful phrases. Um, there's a bhikkhu named uh, Bhante Nyanananda who compares, in Buddhism we have the citta, which is sort of, um, Ajahn Suchitta compares it to the palm of the hand, and then you have manas, which is the intellect, and that's composed of kind of these here active qualities of the mind. So you have the pinky, which is Vedana feeling, ring finger perception, middle finger intention, uh, contact is the pointer finger, and attention is the thumb. And these things grab objects and press them to the palm, the chitta, which is sort of the heart or the subjective quality to taste it. And I, I think a lot of times meditation is seen as grabbing object after object, breath, a, a word. And uh, for me, what Ajahn Kovilo is pointing to and what the third foundation points to is it's really important sometimes to just let the hand fall open and feel a breadth of spaciousness and not to be grasping an object, but just to let the chitta be open and calm and, and relaxed. And it's really good to find a skillful phrase for that. Um, so the ones Ajahn Kobilo is pointing to with you know, the bodies and the mind just expands. Um, but also if people are familiar with long porch uh, sumedos, phrases, um, one really useful phrase is, it's like this, it's like this, 
And there's another great phrase he says, it's never been more like this than it is now. <laughs> <laughs> Or just any of the Four Noble Truths, like, oh, this is suffering. and Or just labeling, like, anger, sadness. And somehow that brief, once you get the right shape in your hand, like, oh, this is anger, you can just let it go and just relax back into that relax. So for me, that's, that has a quality of mind knowing mind in the sense of it just doesn't have an object. So somehow the chit is a lot more open to its own taste. Ajahn Kalur, your talk uh, inspired me to uh, share my aspiration that I've recently like set. And that is, I've been realizing the importance of simplifying my practice. So I recently like set an intention to, um, for now, only solely focus on the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And for now, kind of like take a break from everything else or all, all other sources of guidance. And uh, and today, while we were chanting, we, we chanted the Eightfold Path, and that felt like a sign for me. And another focus is uh, I, I have also read some books on personal development, and and I noticed that that really helps, um, especially for like I think lay people who also have to survive in a, in a daily world. Um, so incorporating that with our monastic. Um, guidance, I found that to be really helpful. And Atomic Habits is one of my favorite personal development books. So you mentioning that, that also felt like a confirmation. And another book that about habits that really resonates with me is uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And a lot of the things that I've learned from that book also seems to align with what we learn um, from the Buddha's teachings. Um, so yeah, I recommend everybody to check that out too. And lastly, um, I am traveling soon, so I just wanted to know how I can be at peace knowing that I am traveling at this time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Prakriti, for sharing that. And maybe we could get three sparkling sadhu. Sadhu means way to go, way to go, way to go. So we can say it three times together, sparkly. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yeah, thanks for sharing. That's that's great. Um, it's inspiring. There's this kind of positive feedback loop when you hear about other people making intentions. So, um, and just just being at peace with uh, with traveling. This mind knowing mind practice um, can bring some measure of peace for that because wherever you go, there's your mind. So. Um, Uh, seeing, seeing if you can, if that can make sense, sense for you and uh, be meaningful for you. But I'd be curious, Ajahn, if you have any more specific. Hmm. <laughs> I know that one teacher says when he was going to take a trip, he just, instead of thinking of himself moving through the world, he just thought of the world moving past him. Um, Long Porsuchito says after a while, time stopped being relevant and just the sense of the chitta, changing or unchanging. A and I think really noting what you've come across with your practice, I know how much you've founded yourself this last year in, in this path and you know all these external shifts of country or job or relationship are so minor in the scheme of things compared to having contact with the Dhamma. So, you're going nowhere. You found your home. Just like, make sure to meditate every day, bow in the morning and evening, and yeah, know you've entered a, a lineage much older than this lifetime. So for me, there's comfort in realizing you're not, you know, yeah, w the wandering you did before this is much, much more than you are doing now, no matter where you go. Yeah. Judith, I think, had one. <laughs> we have two people online. Um, Let, let's get Judith one. first. She's been okay. raising her hand. Yeah. Okay. So there's a line here that we chanted, and we chanted it more than once. Having put away covetousness and grief for the world. 
So that grief for the world part is, I'd love advice on how to put away grief for the world. Like in the last week, the world experienced the hottest day ever on Sunday, which was overcome on Monday as then the hottest day in the world. Die off of coral reefs, record temperatures in oceans. Um, I, I experience grief for the world. Part of that is beautiful and something you really want to protect. I mean, it points to, it's mixed up. What you're experiencing is mixed up with uh, compassion, which is a really great thing that you want to cultivate, the ability to sympathize with other people, with other beings, with the world. Um, you really want to protect that. But the word that's being pointed to here is domanasa, which is mana, like Ajahn Nispo is pointing out, is mind and do is like dukkha, so it's like the mind which has been become depressed. And in a Buddhist conception, this word, it's not like, yeah, in English, grief is like a mixed, can be a mixed quality. Um, there can be some intelligence to it, whereas in Pali, in the Buddhist conception, it's a holy, there's, there's nothing redeeming about domanasa. So abandoning that l aspect of grief or that downheartedness, this depressiveness, which is always unskillful and always unhappy, uh, unhealthy and unhelpful, which just brings you down and makes each of us less capable of responding in a spontaneous and awake and alert and attentive and appropriate way. Um, so as the more that we can cultivate, the more that you can cultivate and lean into that compassion and lean away from that domanasa, this kind of downheartedness, um, then yeah, being able to parse those out, then things will get brighter and you'll s you won't have lost any of your capacity to touch into the dukkha, uh, the suffering of, of the world. Yeah, I'd, I'd also just add that um, you know, the Buddha spoke about four kinds of kama, bright, dark, both bright and dark, and then neither bright nor dark. And neither bright nor dark is the karma of the path towards the end of kama. And there's a cycle called transcendent dependent origination, where dukkha leads to a s uh, faith and a search. A and I, I would take that very seriously, because the world and people often don't wake up unless there is crisis. Um, you know, people, I, I know a lot of people in this generation are sort of like, what's, is it worth bringing people into the world now? And my grandparents' generation materially was very wealthy, but I think spiritually many of them were very impoverished. And I don't know if I'd wish that situation on anyone. And people now, there is crisis in many ways, but the people I know are, are spiritually alive in a way that's very, and, and these are broad stro strokes, and there are many people in my grandparents' generation who are very spiritually awake. But just to say, I think there's enormous chance in this moment to live a very noble life filled with meaning and you know that's maybe this yes there are these crises and there's people waking up because of them i mean look at look at this and we don't know where things lead there's a really good book by rebecca uh is it rebecca solnit called uh, paradise built in hell and it's about yeah that's the one and it's about these crisis situations that brought people together in a way that made it the most meaningful time of their lives. And I'm not wishing for the world to heat up, but just to say, you know, who knows where these trajectories actually lead. And I think just the Buddhist path is knowing how you interact with that and keep a bright mind, like Ajahn Kovilo was saying. You want your nurses to be and your doctors to be happy and bright-minded and bright-hearted. And that's what we can bring to this. You know, refuge isn't thinking the city will never burn. It's knowing that if the city burns, you'd walk to care for those in it and you know where you fit. And, and that's what these refuges can give us, I think. So, but yeah, uh, yeah, you're not alone in that one. So thank you. Maybe the questions on Zoom?
Hi, uh, Johns. Thank you so much. Um, I want to take a second to rejoice in my spiritual friends for, you know, seeing the dangers and grief and rejoicing in a noble eightfold path. I wanted to ask you a question just for as we go into Vasa and we're deepening our practice. I, I feel drawn to the the sutta, the story of Ananda finding out that Venerable Sariputta had passed away and seeing that someone who is even a stream mentor experiences grief and just kind of contemplating what the Buddha taught him uh, in relation to hearing the news that Venerable Sariputta had passed away. So he asked him, um, and my intention is to get some encouragement and some insight that you might want to share from what I what I uh, say, just to inspire the practice moving forward into the, the next couple of weeks. So he asked him, did uh, Venerable Sariputta take away your aggregate of virtue? Did he take away your aggregate of samadhi? Did he take away your aggregate of wisdom? Did he take away your aggregate of liberation, as, as I understand it? And so what I hear from this is that these qualities, when we cultivate sila, when we cultivate samadhi, when we cultivate wisdom, and when we cultivate uh, freedom, we are creating uh, freedom from grief. And so in to be a good friend is to cultivate this path for ourselves and to encourage, approve, and praise these qualities in others. And that's what we're doing in this very moment, is that when we come together, we are uh, encourage, we are creating, we're cultivating the Noble Eightfold Path as a way to be free from grief. And so if I, we're all going to be separated at some point, we can be at peace knowing that, oh, I, I encouraged virtue, I encouraged samadhi, I encouraged, approved and praised of wisdom and, and uh, freedom, that is uh, true friendship. And um, is there anything that uh, you uh, this might inspire in you that would be good for me to hear for my practice at going into solitude? Joseph, maybe you can come on Wednesday. I didn't know you were going into solitude, um, but I'll be curious to hear more about that. Um, so yeah, nothing is coming up immediately. It's a great reflection. And yeah, you're encouraging of all those good things is fantastic. So, yeah, thank you. And if we um, did want to, I can't see who that next person is, but. Hello, uh, Vanda Vivanka. Uh, one, um, one day I have a quick question, like it might be funny, but uh, I am just, when I start sitting, it used to be well and fine, but now if my sleep is not complete, I'm just, my mind is like bobbing down, I'm going to sleep. For first 10, 15 minutes, it's like a sleeping mode, then later on when I'm awake, then from there my practice is going. What is your advice? Should I break my sitting, take a power nap and then go back to sitting or just continue the sitting? What's your name again? I can't see you. Sindhu Bande. Singa? Sindhu. Sindhu, Sindhu. Good to see you. Uh, sorry, you're sort of far away on the TV screen. Okay. Um, who here has trouble nodding off at meditation? Okay, you can't see this, Sindhu, or maybe you can. No, you can. You're just in very good company. Um, so, yeah, I would say it's that's very common. Different hindrances will come up at different times in your practice, and you develop a tool belt to work with them. Um, so I would say, you know, first begin by uh, using some skillful means. One is to keep your eyes open, just a crack, um, with a soft focus, and that will often keep you a bit more awake. The other is to hold a stone or some object between your thumbs in a bit of a mudra. And if it drops out, you know you've lost mindfulness. Um, I often talk about one monk who uh, was instructed to put matchboxes on his head along with the other monks at the monastery so that if they nodded off, it would fall off and uh, wake them up. And it was Ajahn Brahm, and then he discovered that he could use gum to stick it to his head. And he woke up to a very loud noise and realized it was his head hitting the ground. Um, so don't do that. But you could try balancing something on your head. Um, I would also use, in those situations, maybe lean away from the breath and 
using the nada sound, the sound of silence, that subtle ringing below your auditory landscape, if you've never managed to find it, you can Google a small booklet by Ajahn Amaro called Inner Listening, um, or just put in earplugs, or when you're calm, search for that subtle ringing, and it's the auditory equivalent of the perception of light and can really wake you up quite a lot. The other is to use active meditations like metta instead of the breath. The other is to use, um, do a bit of chanting or walking meditation, take a cold shower. But finally, if none of that is working, I do find sometimes just a power nap of five minutes. Set your alarm for five minutes, lie down, and then right when it gets goes off, just get right back up and start meditating again. And that can be a, a last resort, which can be effective. So. Yeah, you're in good company, and you just have to develop a bit of a, a tool belt for that. And make sure you're getting enough sleep, too. That's relevant. Ajahn, yes. anything? Yes, Bhante. Bhante, just I, want, I would like to add here, like uh, today's Dhamma talk of Bhante is very inspiring in a sense. Uh, Bhante advises us to take at least two minutes of meditation. At least two minutes. It is very inspiring. Even two minutes can change our uh, state of mind. Thank you, Bhante. Yes. Thank you all. Sadhu. Wishing all happiness. <laughs> sadhu, sadhu. Um, Ajahn, anything else? Okay, I do think we have to wrap up. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for the contributions and questions.